Hello, I'm Gary Chapin from the Center for Collaborative Education, and we'll be walking through one of the series of presentations that will help give a better understanding of quality performance assessment. In this video, we'll explore and explain the basics of task validation. Our goal for this session is to understand the steps of the task validation process. We will also gain further understanding by walking through the task validation protocol. Before we break down the steps of assessment validation, let's make sure we share a common language. Validity and reliability are at the core of the validation process, so it's important that we have a shared definition of each. In order to get a true measurement of student progress, there must be a balanced system of assessment that is multiple and varied. Performance assessments are an important indicator of student achievement and readiness. We make sure these assessments are valid and reliable. In order for an assessment to be valid, the assessment must assess what it intends to assess. In order for a test to have validity, it must also be reliable. This means that the task will be administered fairly, meaning that if it is administered under different conditions to different students by different teachers in different settings, it will deliver consistent results. In baseball, a strike should be so called regardless of the umpire, the batter, the location of the field, or the time of day. In the classroom, a competent score should be so-called regardless of the teacher, the student, the city, or the time of year. Notice, though, that while the strike zone is considered universally consistent, it actually changes for each batter depending on their proportions. That mixture of consistent and flexible is a great metaphor for how we should be approaching our students. Here is a reminder of our process. We are on step two right now. You will take a task that you've already completed to use during the task validation protocol. In order to ensure technical quality, we must look closely at the various aspects of the task in a structured review. The process we will go through uses a task validation protocol, which is tool three in the QPA guide. This list shows areas we cover in the review process. In today's video, we will discuss the first six areas of technical quality, including alignment, clarity and focus, criteria and levels, student engagement, fairness, and adher adherence to principles of universal design. We will discuss the student work analysis after students complete the assessments that we validate. This will come later in the process. Alignment is critical to ensure assessments achieve their purpose ensuring validity. Does the assessment directly assess competencies or work study practices? Does it assess those at the depth of knowledge level required by the competency? It is important that wherever we see language that represents those areas of alignment, we are all consistent. All documents, teacher instructions, rubrics, student instructions should also be checked for alignment. All written and verbal communication should have common language. Let's talk for a moment about depth of knowledge. What is the difference between difficulty and complexity? Please pause the video and take a moment to write a response. There are difficult things that are not complex. Jeopardy is famously hard, but all they're asking for is level one recall. Driving and Minecraft are both very complicated. Think of how many things you have to coordinate in order to drive safely. But once you learn them, it would be hard to say that they were difficult. The intended student learning outcome determines the DOK level. Ask yourself, what mental processing must occur in order to meet the learning target? A quick way to determine the different depths of knowledge is seen here. Think of DOK 1 and 2 as having a single answer or process, while DOK 3 and 4 have multiple processes or answers and require evidence. Again, depth of knowledge is about complexity, not difficulty. 
Traditionally, many teachers were taught that the verb indicated the complexity of a question. In reality, it it's what comes after the verb that really indicates the complexity. Take a look at how the same verb can be used in all four DOK levels. Please pause the video if you need more time to review this slide. One way to ensure reliability in an assessment is through clarity and focus. The assessment should be clear to the students, parents, and other teachers who use the assessment. It should be clear to all audiences what the student is being asked to do. Being specific helps with clarity. As seen in this cartoon, Lucy was not specific enough in her feedback to Snoopy. Another way to ensure the technical quality of an assessment is through student engagement. If a student is unwilling or unable to engage with a task, we do not get a clear picture of what a student knows and is able to do. The reality is that students don't actually show us their skills and knowledge. They show us what they are willing to show us of their skills and knowledge. Creating an engaging assessment helps us get a fuller picture of what we're trying to assess. Some ways to accomplish this is to strive to make connections to real world situations. We can give students choice in their work when appropriate. We can be culturally responsive to help students identify with the assessment. Finally, allowing multiple modalities may help us get a better picture of the students' skills and knowledge. As a team, Think about a task you've given and identify three ways you could increase student engagement through real-world authenticity, choice and ownership, cultural relevance, or multiple modalities. Pause the video to discuss and press play when you are ready to continue. Now that we've discussed student engagement, we will move on to step four of the validation process, criteria and levels. Simply put, criteria and levels refer to the rubrics we use to assess student work. Rubrics are central to performance assessment. The quality of a rubric greatly impacts the technical quality of a task, and a lot of what makes a good task is mirrored in the rubric, such as alignment, what counts, what the student sees in the rubric, is what you will get. Coherence. Are there clear and reasonable distinctions between the levels? Clarity. Does everyone understand what is meant by the descriptors? And practicality. Is it easy to use for teachers and students? Rubrics will be discussed more thoroughly in a separate module. The fifth step in the validation process is fairness. We include fairness to ensure that students are given the best shot at showing what they know in an assessment. It is important to know kids well, where they are in their language levels, what can they do with language, where do they get stuck, what, each, what is each kid's growing edge. Being mindful that as we make language more accessible to kids, we're not changing the level of rigor. Keep a set of three to four students in your head who have different language-based needs. Can student A access the task? Can student B extend the task? This cartoon illustrates some of the challenges students may face in their attempt to hit a target. To quote Einstein, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will leave its whole life believing it is stupid. Supports we give to students come in the form of accommodations and modifications. The difference is important. If the task was to climb to the top of a tree, an example of a modification would be changing the tree to a bush, meaning change the task and the level of thinking required. An example of an accommodation would be giving a ladder, meaning providing level appropriate reading material, a dictionary, and oral readings of the task. We usually make accommodations to tasks. Modifying the task means changing the target. If you feel that this is necessary, please consult with the special education representative on your team to ensure that a modification is in alignment with the student's IEP or 504 plan. 
Universal design re refers to the layout of the task. The layout should support students in being able to understand what is being asked of them. Look at option one. This paragraph is dense and the parts of the assessment are not obvious. Option two lays out the expectations clearly using a consistent format and providing graphic cues provides clarity for the student. The primary task of the task validation protocol is to ensure that the performance assessment is of high technical quality. Still, keeping our focus on step two of the task validation process, we will go through the steps using a task that one of your team members has brought today. Before we get into the protocol, let's identify the roles of the people in your group. I will be serving as your remote facilitator. I will talk you through each step and let you know when to pause for discussion. If you haven't already decided who will be sharing work, you will need to do that in a moment. The presenter will be explaining the work to the group and answering clarifying questions. We will need a timekeeper who will keep a close watch on the time so we are sure to fit all the steps in. It's helpful if the timekeeper is an assertive person who isn't afraid to push the group along. The recorder is an optional role. If the presenter is not comfortable taking notes, he or she can ask for a recorder. Finally, the friend of the facilitator is the role of a person who can help make sure that the conversation is on task and moving forward. Please pause the video to determine your roles and press play when you are ready to continue. This is the protocol we'll be following with modified times to help fit into your meeting time. I'll give you an overview of each step as we go through the process and you will pause the video for the allotted time to complete each step. If you're a timekeeper, please know I'll include the time frames on each slide as we go through the process so you don't need to write these down now. Let's move to the next slide to discuss norms. Step one is a review of the norms. Norms provide equity for each participant and structure to an ensure an efficient process. Please silently review the norms before beginning. Give a thumbs up if you understand and agree to all the norms. Discuss any clarifications or changes you would like to make. It is important that your group is in agreement of the norms before beginning. Please pause the video and review these now, then press play when you are all in agreement. Step two is the presentation of the work. The presenter should explain the overview of the task, including the context and what students will be expected to do. As a participant, please just listen and write down any questions you have for later. Please pause the video for up to four minutes as your presenter talks you through the work you are going to look at. Step three is the examination of the work. Participants should quietly examine the overview, student instructions, and rubric while taking notes in preparation for the discussion that will follow. Please pause the video for up to six minutes now. Now that you've had a chance to look at the work, your group will have two to four minutes for clarifying questions. Remember, clarifying questions are simple, factual questions that require little think time for your presenter's response. If the response is not a quick one, it's probably a probing question, and it's best that you save that question for later. The purpose of clarifying questions is to give the participants clarity about what they are looking at so that they can give their best feedback. Examples of a clarifying question might be, Will students work in groups? What units come before or after this work? You may not need the full four minutes for this step. Please pause the video and take up to four minutes now. In step five of the task validation process, the group is asked to use the assessment validation checklist to evaluate the task. 
During this process, the presenter sits silently and takes notes while the facilitator reads each question aloud. The group should come to consensus on whether the answer to each question is a yes or no, stopping only if they are unable to gain consensus. The timekeeper should keep a close watch on the clock to ensure that each step is covered. Before we get into the assessment validation checklist, let's review each of the areas that you'll be examining. The first is alignment. Ask yourself, is the task aligned to competencies, habits of engaged learners, and a level three or four depth of knowledge? For clarity and focus, ask yourself, could anyone pick this up and use it? Could another teacher teach this task? Would a student know what to do even if the teacher wasn't in the room? Would a parent be able to figure out what is being asked of his or her student? Next is student engagement. Here we ask, where are there opportunities for student choice? Is the task connected to a real world issue? Criteria and levels is all about the rubric. Is the rubric clear? Does it assess what it attends to assess? For fairness, we ask, is this accessible to all kids? Are there scaffolds available? Finally, universal design is about the format. Can all kids identify the steps and products? Are the documents visually accessible? Now that we've reviewed, please pause the video for up to 20 minutes so the facilitator can begin asking questions. Now that the participants have discussed each area of the task validation process and provided feedback for the presenter, the presenter should join us to reflect on what he or she has heard. This is the presenter's time, so the other participants should remain silent and give the floor over to the presenter. If you have less than eight minutes left, please adjust the time for this and the debrief to accommodate for both steps before the PLC ends. Pause the video now and let the presenter share. Now for the final step, the debrief. This is a time to think about how the group did with the norms and to think about the implications of this discussion on the classroom. Take the last few minutes to let everyone address one or more of the questions on the slide. What did your team do well? What could your team have done better? What supports do you need? What are the implications for instruction? Pause the video now to address these questions. For next steps, as a team, you should determine next steps, including who will be responsible for what and when tasks will be expected to be done. This should be completed before your next PLC. Thank you for joining the presentation today.